the gut and the brain are inextricably linked because there's the vagus nerve. So anatomically and, you know, from when we're a little uh, fetus, uh, these cells develop and as they grow, they, and our nervous system develops, we develop a, a vagus nerve. So there's this real physical anatomical connection. But the vagus nerve is also a two-way superhighway. And because it communicates between the, the gut and the brain all of the time, and because in the gut uh, houses more than 90% of the serotonin receptors in the body, it's a very significant place that I feel for many years we've not paid enough attention to in psychiatry. One very simple thing is we know that when someone is prescribed an SSRI, such as Prozac or Zoloft, they often develop gastrointestinal symptoms initially as a side effect. We counsel our patients on that all the time. And yet, you know, we don't talk about the fact that this happens because of your gut and your brain connection and because of the receptors. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Uma, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much, Srinivas. I really was looking forward to this conversation so much. Yeah. Well, so I found out uh, about your work by way of your husband, Srini Pillay, who, as I was telling you here, has probably been one of our most popular and, you know, well-liked podcast guests today. So no pressure on you at all. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm but, excited to hear that, but uh, I feel a slight bit of pressure. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we, we get into, uh, you know, your work uh, and the new book that you wrote, um, <clears throat> I want to start by asking you, uh, what is one of the most important things that you learned from one of both one or both of your parents that shaped and influenced who you've become and what you've ended up doing with your life? I think it has to do with both my parents having a real ethical alignment in life in what they did. They came uh, from very different careers. Um for an age in, I grew up, I was born and raised in South Africa to South Asian parents and uh, fourth generation. And my parents uh, really didn't have much growing up. But despite that, they really taught us some very important values in life. And those hold true for me today. Um, so despite my mother being a double boarded physician and the only woman in her class in medical school at that time and, and age, um, she felt very strongly that, you know, medicine was not about being wealthy and making money. It really was about caring for patients and doing your best job. My dad wanted to be educated beyond high school and didn't have the money to do so. And he built his own uh, plastics company at that time. We're talking many years ago, uh, and it wasn't for food products, uh, just things like video boxes and rulers and things like that. And he was always aligned with the clients he attracted. And he did not work, even though he didn't start up with much money in life, he did not work with people that he didn't like or didn't feel aligned with. So that has struck with, uh, has really stuck with me throughout my life. No. So, you know, I, one thing I wonder is having grown up in South Africa, you know, as the child of Indian parents who were, were immigrants in a country like South Africa, do you deal with the same sort of uh, immigrant narratives that, you know, Indian American kids do where early in life you're kind of taught, hey, you know, if you want a good life, become a doctor, lawyer, or engineer, like these are your choices. Probably best not to think about anything else, because at least here, I find that to be very, very prevalent in uh, Indian culture. So I wonder, is it different when you grow up in a place like South Africa? And then the other I wonder is, you know, you have two parents who have wildly different educational backgrounds, one who didn't finish high school and the other who's a, a double you know, board certified physician. And so I wonder what they taught you about education. Like what was the you know, value placed on education in a household when you have that contrast in parents and their education? So actually, I just want to correct that. My dad did graduate high okay. school. In fact, he was top of the class, but he didn't have money to and neither did his family to go to college. Okay. Um, so, so I just want to correct that because yeah, 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 no, 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 no worries. Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, I think that immigrant cultures are very similar. So, uh, we are fourth generation South African Indian, but those values of study, be educated. There are certain professions that you know you will always be well respected and be able to be safe and earn a living. 
were definitely conveyed. And I think there's a real similarity with what I see um, having immigrated to the United States and, and in, in the immigrant culture. I think that um, one of the things people don't realize about growing up uh, a person of color in South Africa is that um, growing up in South Africa in apartheid, there was only black and white. So whatever color you were, it didn't really matter. There were sort of the white privilege, and then there was, you know, you, you had less privilege. Um, that being said, I think that the way my parents handled that with us was to provide opportunities to travel overseas when we could so that we were exposed to integrated cultures and also to focus on an education that would be a way to, maybe the word would be power through or to make your way through um, undaunting, um, unprecedented times, such as how would they overcome apartheid? They, they didn't have the means to do that on their own. But what they could do is empower their children by focusing on education. And they both did that. Um, you know, my um, my mom, as I mentioned, was was ahead of her times in, ter- in terms of uh, women of color going to medical school and was a trailblazer in that way. My dad, in a similar way, um, you know, was a trailblazer in the uh, business world because people would always say, well, you know, which where did you study and how did you learn this? And he, you know, he was one of those people who really came from the school of hard knocks, as they call it, and uh, because he was smart, used that in a way to build a very successful business. So I think that the um, and yet even even three of us when we when, when my family had a little we were a little bit more comfortable. Um, there was always that value system, you know, of 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 ethics being important, how you conduct yourself in life being important, you know, um, being respectful to elders, you know, saying please and thank you to people, just having certain um, certain graces that I'm very, very glad I grew up with. Um, and, and I think that those were important to me. Um, the way that they they sort of encouraged us was not to say you, you can either do this or that. They focused on, we really want you to do well and be educated. We want you to be happy. We want you to take the opportunities. And these are the opportunities we can provide. And I think that that uh, led to, I have three other siblings and all of us are physicians. And my dad was not the phys- the only non-physician in the family would would joke and say, you know, all these doctors in the family and I have a small business and I make more money than them. But again, it was, it was, it was really funny. Not only was it true, but again, you know, every one of us was sort of aligned with a certain aspect of medicine that we loved. Me, I was the psychiatrist in the family. We have a surgeon, we have a, uh, you know, a a, a cardiac, uh, a new, uh, uh, nuclear medicine specialist. We have, you know, a, a general practitioner who's super qualified. So it's, it's like this whole disparate bunch of, of, of uh, doctors, but really aligned around, I feel, what my parents raised us with. Hmm. Well, it's funny because like my sister is a doctor, her in-laws are doctors. And I'd tell my dad, I was like, listen, I can't make the family Zoom because our family Zooms are starting to feel like a damn coronavirus <laughs> briefing every time we have one. <laughs> We try, we try not to do that. We, try, we really try not to do that. And although my father's late, you know, he would sit at the dinner table and just chuckle about the way yeah. we go on. But again, I, I, you're actually right. You know, we really try to make it about other stuff and just not hone in on all the medical uh, medical issues going on. Yeah. You know, so one thing, growing up during apartheid, um, having seen apartheid end and now kind of seeing what's happening with race relations in the United States, like, do you do you feel like you're seeing history repeat itself, or what is it like for somebody with your worldview to see what's going on? You know, it's uh, it's it's painful. Um, it's it's it it's. I think that there's a way in which when um, we immigrated here to study, uh, for the opportunity to study and 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 be actually at Harvard. Um, I I think that there's a way in which you compartmentalize areas of your own trauma and pain and what you've been exposed to growing up. Um, and I think you try to be resilient and you focus on that. So this has brought up a lot of uncomfortable feelings. And um, I I don't know that I have the breadth of understanding of uh, any country in the world to know that this is history repeating itself, having not been there at other times. 
Mm-hmm. But I know that it's painful, and and you know whatever small part that I can do, um, I I try, and sometimes it's more privately done. But again, I think it's um, it's un- unfortunate. It's it's brought up a lot of that uh, for me as well, and I I really see when people are hurting. Yeah. So, uh, what made you choose psychiatry of all things? Like, why that particular path? Like, how did you end up down this particular path in medicine? So this is a funny story. So even though my dad was not the doctor in the family, he had really, really great ideas. You know, he he had and and he and he wasn't shy to share his opinion. He he said to me, "Well, you know," uh, and and this this was true. I think of immigrant families, uh, and I think it 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 is true of Indian culture uh, and certain other cultures generationally. He said, "Well, you know, it would be really nice to to be married. So when you go to medical school, it would be nice if you could choose." a specialty like dermatology or radiology where people, you know, where you'll have more time with your family. This was his opinion, you know, and and, and, and he shared it and and I would just crack up laughing, you know, and I'd say, dad, you you know that you're not going to be able to force me into anything. So let's have a conversation about it. But, you know, we had a good, we had a good uh, relationship while we both had strong opinions. So interestingly, um, what I found was that when I was in medical school, the thing that I enjoyed the most, you know, we go through all of the rotations and all the specialties, what I really enjoyed the most was speaking to people, hearing their story, not just from the perspective of, you know, you're taught to take a really good history when you go to medical school, but beyond that, hearing about, you know, their relationships with their family, more really about their lives. And I understood that I enjoyed that about people. And I really gravitated toward that. And felt I should um, really I, that I should apply for the residency that I most loved and what most appealed to me, and I I also feel it was consistent with um, my personality um, or what I think of my personality and and you know so far I've I've loved um, doing this work and and it's brought a great deal of meaning to me and my patients have taught me an immense amount in my life. Support for this podcast comes from Atlassian. Ready to amp up your IT strategy? Jira Service Management from Atlassian turns IT teams into rock stars, unlocking service delivery at high velocity. Learn more at Atlassian.com slash Jira Service Management. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym, avoiding stress. But a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Don't miss our weekend special. Save $1,000 on the Sleep Number 360 Special Edition Smart Bed. Plus special financing. Ends Monday. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. If you're like most people, you probably have thousands of photos on your smartphone. With cameras like the ones in our pockets, everyone is a photographer. Maybe you're already a pro, or you're thinking about turning your hobby into a business, or maybe you're like my friends who send me Christmas cards with pictures of their family every year, which is something I guess only married people seem to do. No matter your genre or your plans for your photos, make Zenfolio the place to present your portfolio and find new clients. Anybody can create a gorgeous photography website in minutes with their easy no-code drag-and-drop templates to showcase their photos and style. They make it easy to sell prints, cards, canvases, and more to your clients around the world. And they manage and track shipping, and you get paid directly. Get started for free today at zenfolio.com slash unmistakable. Again, that's zenfolio.com slash unmistakable. Mm. So I have to ask just uh, out of personal yeah. curiosity, because um, you've brought him up multiple times, you know, in, in the time that we've been talking uh, about this relationship with your dad. And, and the reason it, it comes to mind for me is because my dad and my sister are like as tight as it gets, you know, like it's the kind of thing where she has an impact on him where two of us could tell my dad the exact same thing. And he'll be like, yeah, that's nonsense. And my sister will come and say the same thing again. And he'll be like, yeah, that makes complete sense. <laughs> And so what I, I wonder, you know, how many, you know, how many siblings are there? Are you sort of the sort of princess of in your dad's eye? Like, what, what is it? I think that's the thing is, this is something that I've been trying to really understand is, is what is it? I mean, you're a psychiatrist, so maybe you can answer this for me. Why do fathers and daughters have this kind of bond? 
You know, I wish I wish I knew the exact answer to that. So so let me tell you a little bit about my family. I have an older sister who's wonderful. Uh, and and actually, fortunately, we, we're all close siblings. We, we have our, you know, moments uh, that we go through, but we remain close, even though we're in different countries. And I have two younger brothers. Um, and I would say that my my uh, dad considered us special in different ways. Like, like I think that he, um, I think he felt that he could encourage my uh, my academics because I was sort of an all all rounder. You know, I, if I did ballet, I, I I had to be the the prima donna performer. If I did, you know, studied I studied piano forte, and I did that. I had I, I was just one of those kids. So I'm not trying to. Um, toot my own horn. I'm just saying that he encouraged that because he saw that in me. And I think my sister, he understood her differently. She was super smart, but more of a fun loving um, kid who wanted to party, have lots of, you know, uh, have lots of boyfriends and, 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 you know, she would study the night before for tests at medical school and that kind of stuff. But I think he understood us each differently. And I, I'm not trying to imply that we had the perfect family. We certainly um, didn't. I mean, there were times that were not, not that fun. But I think that we always moved through it with a sense of love and community and respect. Um, so, no, I wasn't I, – I didn't consider myself a princess. But then if you ask my sister, she might say, of course she was a princess in the family. <laughs> you know, I don't feel that about her. Maybe because, you know, years of therapy have helped me. I'm not sure. but. Um, I think that uh, I think it is a special relationship, and I can't say why. Yet the funny thing is that I'm very aligned with my mom. You know, I, I sort of uh, here's a here's a cool story you would like. So when she graduated medical school, um, she was told you shouldn't do psychiatry because that's a crazy profession. You have to be, you know, um, a, a specialist in a specialist in terms of internal medicine. And so she went on to be primary care and rheumatology, which she loved. Um, and so it was interesting because the perception of the Indian community and um, her family was, you know, it won't be as respected if you do psychiatry. So in some ways I'm aligned with her because I've sort of lived that out for her. And mm-hmm. she loves talking to me about my patients and, you know, anonymously, of course, but just about the, the concept of it and, and that type of thing. And in my book, you know, my dedication, people keep asking me, what was the advice your mother gave you? Yeah, that's why I started with that question. <laughs> And it's it, and it was the fact that my husband Srini was in her tutorial group. She was his professor, and she met him before I did. And so one day she, you know, she comes, uh, she comes home and she says, "So have you met that um, that new, you know, that 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 this, this student in my group? And his name is so and so. Of course, we're all in different classes." And I said, "Mom, I don't know who you're talking about." And she said, "Well, I just, you know, he's he's a really nice young man, and I, you know." I think he's he's the kind of young man maybe you should consider dating. And that's all she said, you know. But I think she kept priming me. She kept priming me because she was smart enough to know that I'm not the kind of kid you tell tell them what to do. Same with my yeah. dad. They kind of knew that. And, um, you know, she sort of primed me. And then, of course, somehow the other serendipitously in this large school, he popped up on my radar. Mm. And it, it was fascinating because she saw that, you know, she, she had that deep set understanding of me, um, you know, speaking to the relationship that we have with each parent to understand that, um, that, that was someone who could kind of be a good match. Um, and, you know, I, I have to thank her for that because, because it's worked out. So, yeah. uh, she saw that long before I did. Well, that's funny. I, you know, some people listening to this might know I was recently on a Netflix documentary called Indian Matchmaking and somehow everybody and, you know, my parents, their friends and everybody have descended like vultures thinking that, oh, like we have like the perfect person for you. Of course. And I'm like, you guys are really bad at this based on everything that you've sent me so far. I'm sorry, but you're all fired. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned like you don't see it, but your sister does as a princess. I was like, yeah, that's because she's the older sibling. <laughs> like, but probably, you know. it, it could well be, you know, I, I bet if she's listening to this, she'd be, of course, she's a princess string of us, you know, but it's, it's so, it's so funny. It's, it's just like, you don't see it that way, you know? Yeah. Well, I just know this because it, it's, you know, my, my sister just has an effect on my dad that none of us, the rest of us do, you know, he talks to her every day and like we talk every couple of days and we hit a dead end in about 15 minutes. It's like, okay, <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll talk to you later, you know, but maybe that's just because, you know, two men talking. Uh, 
Well, let's do this. Um, let's let's actually get into into the content of the book. What prompted you to want to explore this connection between uh, you know food and the brain? I, I think to me, I was really thrilled because of the fact that so much has been written about this, but unfortunately, a lot of it has been written by people who have used themselves as guinea pigs and tried to basically pass it off as real science. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, it, it's it sort of starts with how I've been practicing psychiatry, and uh, again. You're going to say, wow, the psychiatrist, she just keeps going back to her childhood. But the truth is I grew up in this large Indian family and lots of, you know, um, mothers, grandmothers, aunts um, uh, in the kitchen and older cousins. So I wasn't expected to cook. But I was always hanging out in the kitchen, loved food. And because of the doctors in the family, there's a focus on healthy nutrition. Um, so there was those, there were those elements. My mom knew that I loved science, so she taught me to bake. So the, the joke I share with everyone is when I did get married, um, my poor mother-in-law uh, thought, you know, she was an excellent cook. And, and she was like, you know, my child is going to eat you know, cake every day. What am I going to do? Um, and I always uh, laugh about that. Although she never said it, I, I, she, she she may have thought it. She was she was far too gracious to say something like that. But you know, the the journey of me me cooking was when we moved uh, to study the recipes and spices uh, were the one thing that I could really bring with me in terms of moving away from a, a very beloved family. And I found that immersing myself in learning my recipes and just practicing and learning to cook, which was a journey. Sweeney actually learned to cook before I did. Um, and uh, so, you know, he, he was a good guide and a great t- taste tester, but I found that it really offered me mindfulness and peace of mind and something I look forward to at the end of each day. And I started to bring that into the office. As I learned about psychiatric medications, I felt that my patients needed more tools if they would develop side effects. So how they ate, lifestyle changes, other things that they could be doing began to be an important part of my my narrative with them. And as I learned more and studied more, it grew. Uh, And I I started to understand that there were these connections. Um, Going to culinary school was was really, that was a path of passion. Julia Child had been my food hero and someone I watched on public television because we couldn't afford cable. Um, so, so in those days when I was cooking, I would watch her. I also realized she went to culinary school later in life and decided to follow that. I wish I could say to people that I had this grand plan and it would all come together, but it really happened organically. I was incorporating these methods of talking about nutrition and lifestyle with my patients. I studied nutrition. I went to culinary school, not expecting it to come together. But as nutritional psychiatry developed as a more nascent field, I would say that we've been studying nutrients for decades. The mentors at the hospital where I work have been studying folate, methylfolate, omega-3 fatty acids for decades. But the words of you know nutrition and mental health and nutritional psychiatry came forward. And I had the opportunity um, with my mentors to start my own clinic and and. You know, this is a long way to say that the the concept was developing throughout my career and a very few, two very important things happened, which accelerated its sort of emergence into the public eye. Um, Some of the blogs that I was writing and and media that I was contributing to as I developed this um, went viral. And because of that, um, an agent that my husband works with I had, you know, had a conversation and really they felt that this idea was ready, ready to be born to the world and that it had developed and grown and there was was science behind it enough that I was using that could be shared. And that's how the idea formed. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have, I would have said, Srinivas, I'm going to write a cookbook. I'm going to talk about my family (laughs) recipes. Um, But, you know, sometimes it's, it's the work you're doing and you're doing it every day and other people look in and say, hey, this is what you're doing could be of value to others. And it's not that I didn't value the work I was doing with my patients and what I was doing. It's more that I didn't see see it as a book concept. And that mm-hmm. really came forward um, with, uh, with, a, with a really wonderful agent and, and you know, a, a kind of an editor that I truly value who helped me refine that idea even further. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym, avoiding stress. 
but a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Don't miss our weekend special. Save $1,000 on the Sleep Number 360 Special Edition Smart Bed, plus special finance. Ends Monday. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. Even though my family is filled with amazing cooks, me being in the kitchen is basically a fire hazard waiting to happen, but I still want to eat healthy. And if you want to eat healthier and feel your best, then listen up. This is hands down one of the easiest ways. I've been drinking something called cachava as my breakfast to fuel my day. And it keeps me full for hours and it takes less than a minute to make, which is pretty awesome. So what is it? It's been called the cleanest, most nutrient dense meal imaginable. And I describe it as the best protein, vitamins, and everything you need to eat healthy all in one shake. It's loaded with over 70 superfoods and nutrients like maca root, chia seeds, sacha any, makai berry, acai, and coconut. And it actually tastes really good. The people who built this company started in the jungle on the side of a mountain during a health retreat. And their mission is to bring the world's best superfoods into a single ready-to-go meal to help busy people stay healthy on the go. And Kachava is offering 10% off for the listeners of our podcast. Just go to kachava.com slash creative. Again, that's Kachava. K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash creative for 10% off. If you like The Unmistakable Creative, there's a new podcast I want to tell you about that I think you'll really like. On the Stories of Impact podcast, they go into the science behind innovative tools that help human beings flourish. The birthright of every human being is not just to survive, but to thrive. Hear about the intersection of the science and spiritual practices that give life the deepest meaning and fulfillment. Hear from Deepak Chopra, Lori Santos, and more. The award-winning Stories of Impact's podcast returns for its fifth season. This acclaimed podcast features award-winning veteran journalist Richard Sergey and acclaimed writer and producer Tavia Gilbert. Find them wherever you get your podcast. The Stories of Impact podcast is supported by Templeton World Charity Foundation. Yeah. Well, before we get into to specifics, there's a story you tell at the beginning of the book about getting a cancer diagnosis. And yeah. um, the reason that struck me is because it seems to have happened when you were quite young. And so I, I always wonder when people face situations like that, what decisions you made about how you were going to live lo- your life going forward from that experience? Um, it, it was, it wasn't when I was a child. So it was in my adult years. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, uh, but you, you're right. It was, you know, uh, it wasn't immediate. And I think that, um, you know, when, when you know the, the, the medical, when you know the medications that are chemotherapy and you know the, some of the, the facts behind or the known science behind how these things develop, you, I think it can be a little bit more scary. And I think that the way it changed me, um, well, firstly, a diagnosis of cancer does change a person. You are never the same again. And one of the reasons is that you um, you live each day never knowing, and you have to figure out a way to manage that uh, in yourself and realize that the way to move through it is to move forward and to move forward with immense strength. And that's where sort of nutrition and understanding how my own body works and the things I should do things I don't do well, um, the things I could do better, and the foods that I can eat make a difference. So th- those sort of fortify me in a way that make me feel less worried and less anxious and really help me focus on the positive and, and enjoying the moments that are. You know, so, so when the pandemic hit and I had a book to, to launch, I had to really uh, flip that, that horrible thing on its, on its side and say, well, there must be an opportunity to do this, so let's find it. And and it it I think it helped me change that uh, mm-hmm. in in um, change my narrative, my internal narrative to being much more positive and living in the moment rather than worrying and you know being concerned about something else. I really kind of got my priorities straighter after that. Uh-huh. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, this is something I, I've always wondered. Yeah. You know, so two questions kind of arise from this. And in case you haven't noticed, every time you give me an answer, it leads to two more questions. Are you sure uh, you're not a, yeah, you're sure you're not a psychiatrist? You, <laughs> you guys no, not trust a little me, like I me. have way too many problems of my own to deal with other people's. <laughs> uh, but the, the thing that 
I, I wonder, and I think it was really interesting that one of the things you noted was the fact that if you're a physician, you're, you have this sort of base of knowledge, which makes everything really scary. Cause I, I remember mm-hmm. had you know, two friends who had, had, a, had lost a baby and I thought as doctors, I was like, that's gotta be really strange, but it doesn't change the fact that you're still human and vulnerable to emotions. Yes. And so I, I think that the two questions that, you know, come from this for me is, is one, you know, were, were you scared that the possibility of, you know, <clears throat> like knowing that maybe I could die and also as a psychiatrist, why is it that so often it takes this sort of crucible or really awful thing to happen uh, before somebody makes a significant change to their life? I mean, you see this across the board. It's not just a medical thing or a personal thing. You see it in business too. Like some of the most profitable businesses are, are born out of crisis. Absolutely. I, 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 that's, you know, that's always a fantastic question. And I'm, I'm glad you asked it because I, I, I fumble with the answer myself. Um, I think that for me, it, it, it really had me um, pause. It had me pause and realize that this is now a big thing and I have got to make some big decisions in my life. Um, being concerned with the small stuff and caring about the bigger moments, uh, focusing on the happy moments rather than the worry. I think the, you know, we talked about immigrant culture and, uh, being immigrants both in South Africa and in the United States, I think that one of the things that that transgenerationally gets transmitted is a sense of angst, not necessarily anxiety, but a sense of angst and worry and wanting to achieve and wanting to to, to do better. And I do think that I carry that on for my parents. Um, and I, I think that I've really worked hard to be healthier about it because it had a place in their lives to to live through apartheid and raise an entire family during apartheid. So I, I've tried to work more on that for myself to make it positive. So I think for me, it was um, it, it was it was the lightning rod that I needed at that point. Um, I don't think anyone needs cancer. I'm, I'm I'm not saying that, but but I do think it 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 was what happened in my life that that changed things. By the way, it wasn't the reason that I wrote the book. It, it sort of it, it, I, I wrote the, the introduction to the book right at the end because I wasn't sure I was going to share that. And for me, firstly, because I'm just such a private person and as a psychiatrist, I hadn't shared that with my patients. So I wanted to think through that. Um, and lastly, I, you know, I, I wondered if it had a place in the book, but as I found my voice in writing it, I felt that that was an important aspect to share of how it kicked in for me to work in my in nutritional psychiatry. Um, and then I think, you know, with, with, um, with this type of, of diagnosis, you, I guess, from, I, I guess what really helped me is the fact that fortuitously I had graduated from my residency at Harvard and I had, had done one of the first fellowship fellowships in psychosocial oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Brigham here in Boston. And I had done that really. So the, the fellowship was around working with patients and families around the cancer diagnosis, treatment and psychiatric measures, both therapies and medications. Um, when I got, when I was diagnosed, I reached out to my mentor to ask for advice about who, about how to get treatment at the hospital where I now work. And um, he got back to me immediately. It was late at night. And he said, um, he said a simple line, and we hadn't been in touch for many years. He said, I will treat you. Call me tomorrow or text me. And he left me his number. And, uh, you know, I was, I, I feel very blessed for those types of relationships. Um, and he's, you know, he's a prominent person in, 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 in the world of breast oncology, one of the most prominent. And I had been fortunate to work with him and he was a supervisor when I did my fellowship. So for me, it, it really came full circle. I, I, I couldn't, you know, one doesn't feel blessed by the diagnosis, but you feel blessed by what you have access to in terms of care and support. Um, so that was very meaningful to me. Wow. 
Well, let's uh, let's shift gears and let's actually get into uh, the specific content of the book. Uh, you know, from from the very beginning, it sounds to me like you know what you call the, the gut brain romance basically is the foundation for all of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that was the sense I got from it from yes. reading. So, mm-hmm. can you talk about sort of that whole concept? I mean, you talk about the microbiome and the central and automatic nervous system. Can you expand on that and talk about how it sort of connects to this whole idea of, of your brain on food? Sure. You know, the, the the gut and the brain are inextricably linked because there's the vagus nerve. So anatomically and, you know, from when we're a little uh, fetus, uh, these cells develop. And as they grow, they and our nervous system develops, we develop a vagus nerve. So there's this real physical anatomical connection. But the vagus nerve is also a two-way superhighway. And because um, because it communicates between the, the gut and the brain all of the time, and because in the gut uh, houses more than 90% of the serotonin receptors in the body, it's a very significant place that I, I feel for, for many years we've not paid enough attention to in psychiatry. And yet, as, as a psychiatrist, when I think back to symptoms that I've seen in my patients over the years, one very simple thing is we know that when someone is prescribed an SSRI, such as Prozac or Zoloft, Roxetine or Sertraline, they often develop gastrointestinal symptoms initially as a side effect. Uh, we counsel our patients on that all the time. And yet, you know, we don't talk about the fact that this happens because of your gut and your brain connection and because of the receptors. So, you know, I think that that, that if, if, if I felt it was a really helpful model for people to understand because you know, we were taking, I took 700 references, changed them into, included 550 in the book, but had to make the content digestible so that someone reading it could follow, understand and say, oh, I see, I see what she's saying here. And this is why it's important. Um, nutritional psychiatry is not a soft science. There's there's a lot more evidence behind it than, than people know or realize. And one of the a premises of this book is that we feel some of this information really has not been shared before in this way. Yeah. So one way to do that was to talk about and introduce people to the gut brain axis, the microbiome, what the bacteria do in your gut, how they can be helpful, how they can be hurtful. And, um, you know, I, I also called it the gut brain romance because, you know, romances are not perfect. It's not always Valentine's Day. So in a similar way, you know, those, those, that relationship doesn't always work. And, and when it doesn't work, we can have both, you know, we can have different, diff, different symptoms of different illnesses, but two that are commonly seen, uh, you know, gastrointestinal distress or um, neuroinflammation leading to uh, mental health symptoms. Well, let's let's um, talk about a few of them, because I think to go through all of them would probably be very difficult based on how deep you went in the book. So I, you know, I, I, I was kind of thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, people are going to think I'm insane once they see that. Like, I was like, oh, let's talk about depression, ADHD and libido. It's like, wow. So Srini is depressed, can't focus and really wants to get laid. Um, that's probably the conclusion that anybody would draw from the areas that I've chosen to focus on, which I'm not depressed. I have trouble focusing. And yes, I want to get laid. So there are the answers to those questions for those of you who are wondering. Um, but all joking aside, let's talk specifically about depression, because I think that this is one of those things when I saw it, it was just like, it hit me kind of like a ton of bricks because I've dealt with, you know, depressive symptoms on and off throughout my life. Mm-hmm. And I think it wasn't until I finally hit just a breaking point where I couldn't get out of bed one morning after a bad yeah. breakup that I thought, okay, now now I, I'm at the point where a doctor told me, she's like, this is your breakfast. This is a disaster. She's like, no wonder. Mm-hmm. Um, but let, mm-hmm. let's go into the specifics around this because you talk specifically about, um, you know, foods that dull your mood. But you, you, I think you started by kind of talking about the difference between high glycemic and low gly- glycemic index foods. Exactly. So, you know, the, 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 those, some of those fall into some of the pillars that are theme in the book, meaning that there's some things that, that by resetting for oneself, um, will start you on a better path because there really isn't a, a high glycemic food in the book that will 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 support your mental health. Yeah. So the way that we broke it down was so that people understand because the other thing about the book screen of us was was the fact that so much is out there in the media, in books, in magazines, on television, and pe- my patients come in confused. What I wanted to do is make it simpler for them. This is what a low GI food is. This is what high GI food is. This is what you should eat, and this is what you shouldn't. While it's not as simple as that, there are certain fine nuances. It's also important to understand some healthy eating, eating building blocks for mental health. And some of them include the low, 
low GI carbohydrates and low GI foods, but also things like prebiotics and probiotics. And what are those? Not just, you know, buzzwords or supplements, they're actual foods that you can incorporate. And, um, and then, you know, it's the health, it, it's spices that bring back uh, great nutrients to you, like saffron, which was, a, which was a big surprise, and turmeric, which we know about in many other realms of physical health, but yeah. we didn't really know of in, as much in mental health and, of course, the pinch of black pepper. So, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, many people have heard about over the course of time. But here's, here's the interesting thing. Omega-3 fatty acids have both seafood as well as plant-based sources. And they also work for more than one condition. So it's beyond depression. Human studies have shown them to help anxiety. So, mm-hmm. you know, these are, these are things that uh, translated in that way are hopefully useful uh, quick tips that people can have. Yeah. Well, that, that was one thing I, I, I kind of noticed as I was going through the book. I'm like, why is it that all these foods seem to solve all of these problems? You know, like it, I saw that I was like, wow, wait a minute. Each one of these foods seems to be addressing all the same issues. Um, across the board, there seem to be commonalities between each yes. of the various ailments you brought up. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting to talk to somebody who's Indian about, you know, high glycemic index foods, seeing as to the fact that our entire diet is pretty much that. You know, like I remember I lived at home for a while and I remember I told my mom, I said, you know, mom, I think we should do a gluten-free diet. And she basically made rotis. And I was like, these are terrible. And she was like, yeah, they're gluten-free. What did you think was going to happen? Um, so, you know, what I, I wonder just for, for that, from that context, you know, how do you, how do you think about that? Um, particularly when you have know, come from a culture where, where that has been sort of the default, because like, I remember we went to Costco the other day and, mm-hmm. you know, our roommate who cooks all our meals is gone for a week. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other roommates like, what are you going to get? I was like, oh, those nons look good. I think I'm going to get those. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah. But the thing is, like, you know, we've been very good. Is there sort of like a balancing act or where do you draw the line here? And, and, you know, what would eating in a way that like reduces depression symptoms look like? Sure. Uh, so producing depressive symptoms. So I think that the foods that, you know, I, I do want to address the, the cultural aspect of what you said. I think that the, it's helpful for people to know a few things that they should stay away from. Um, you know, we know that, that highly, highly sugared foods and baked goods and, and you know, uh, pantry staples and, and baked goods that are on the shelf are not good for us because of the added sugars. But sugar actually affects the brain. It can affect your mentation. And even if you le- eat a sugary treat in the moment and feel good, the long-term effect is what's bad for you. And it actually can affect cognition, it's been shown. So yeah. a good reason for your brain to stay away from sugar. The, um, you know, I think you, you, you just covered the high GI carbs. Um, then there are things like artificial sweetness. So the two, you know, that I think have shown the best results, even though in stevia, depression uh, has been associated in the longer term and for other conditions, if I were to say, if you really can't get off something sweet, stevia and erythritol are two you can, you can go to because of the imp- impact on insulin. Um, so, you know, artificial sweetness, if, if you're trying to drink a, a lot of diet soda, may not be the best option and other things like that. We know that fried foods are not good for us, um, but people don't also realize that it's the oils that are often used. The omega-6 in those oils are bad for our brain because they flip the the good ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 um, against us, and, and and which is ultimately bad for the brain. Yeah. And studies of trans fats um, have actually been linked to levels of aggression. So, you know, a good reason in mental health to, to kind of omit those from your diet. Um, and then nitrates. We, we, I found a lot of studies where nitrates in, as an additive in um, different, you know, processed meats um, were, were not great for you because they drove depression. So I think that, that, you know, the reason included lists of things to avoid is people may not realize they're consuming something which isn't great for them. When, yeah. it, when it comes to breads and, you know, say the sort of a, a typical um, South, you know, um, a, a typical in, uh, Indian diet or South Asian diet, the, I think it's about the balance. So, you know, there are ways to, for example, we use turmeric a lot in our food. Turmeric and black pepper is a standard and there's, there's a health benefit right there. It's, I think where we get into trouble is the, the amount of bread the amount of say rice in, in in certain parts of the country and and the um and and the the fats that we cook them in so ghee on its own is not horrible but i think if you if you try to make a healthy cauliflower dish but it's laden with a ton of oil that's not helpful 
And I'm not saying that everyone cooks that way, but I think that there are tweaks we can make within the diet that can can be helpful. For example, you know, I would say have the gluten, the the nuns with with gluten, but don't have it as often. You know, yeah. switch it out with other forms of breads that are now being being um, uh, you know the tons of recipes on the internet for how you can use cauliflower and you know and I'm not saying you have to make it from scratch, but there are ideas to change it up for yourself or what I truly believe is in a treat day. So, you know, a treat day is whether it's your naan or, or, or something else, else that, you know, you wouldn't want to consume in the other days because it's not going to be great for either your overall health or the fact that it's processed or, or whatever the reason might be. Gluten on its own is not necessarily bad. It's often um, the fact that gluten has been shown to, for example, drive anxiety. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if someone is eating bread and we say a healthy source of bread, you know, if your mom is making it from scratch, I would say you're probably really on a good path there, but just don't have it as often. So sometimes right. it's the portion control. So, so you know, including, so, so not only being aware of those foods and then including some healthy kind of pillars that I talk about, the prebiotic and probiotic foods, um, you know, things like eat the rainbow. And why do we say that? Because eat the rainbow, the colors of foods and the polyphenols and antioxidants in those bring back a ton of good nutrients to your brain. And in addition, you can only get fiber from fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, and healthy whole grains. So even if you, you know, whatever your diet is or whatever your meal plan is, whether it has, you know, animal and, and um, uh, uh, seafoods in it, you can't get fiber from those. So so I, uh, to offset that, what you want to do is include those healthy fruits and vegetables, et cetera, to bring back fiber to your diet. And, you know, it's about finding that balance, and then we go in, the, in go into the specifics in the book, like which probiotics to try in foods. You know, my my whole um, my my whole uh, spirit of writing this book is eat the orange and skip the orange juice, which is you know you you're just not going to get the same value from the store bought orange juice, um, no matter what the label says, because of the added sugars and very little yeah. fiber being left. But if you eat the orange. It's, you know, it's a great fruit. You're not eating a ton of them. It's great vitamin C. The fiber and nutrients are right there. Mm, wow. Well, let's uh, let, let's talk about the AD, ADD uh, components a, a bit. It's funny because I'm just reading uh, Gabor Mate's book, Scattered. And so it's been really mm-hmm. kind of fascinating to see it from sort of the, the personality standpoint and now have justifications to my mother as to why I leave the cap off the toothpaste and I'm never going to change that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the this one in particular interested me for several reasons. One, because of the fact that, you know, this is a big issue for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something I've struggled with my entire life that went undiagnosed until I was like 30. And then mm. what I figured out was that there's this interesting sort of contrast in that if you're interested in something, you can focus on it for hours. And if you're not, then you could care less. And, you know, you looked at it both from a food standpoint, but I'd also be curious to talk about it from a pharmaceutical standpoint, because we have, you know, sort of like the medafinil stuff of the world, which I will openly admit I've experimented with. But the the so this is what yeah this is where I'm, I'm curious kind of like what's the role that food plays what role do do pharmaceuticals play uh, and you know how can we improve this you know the I think this is a great segue into something that I always like to share when I when I speak with um, individuals and and I'm interviewed um, it you know food and nutritional strategies and nutritional psychiatry are alongside all other treatments, one does not, you know, uh, one, they're meant to complement each other. They're not meant to replace one another. So if someone is, for example, severely depressed, suicidal, times when a person can't get out of bed, um, as you shared, I mean, those, the, when, when my patients feel that way, I, um, I, I will include food as part of the treatment plan, but that's not first line. They may, in fact, at that point need a medication, may in some instances need hospitalization. Someone is manic, or you know, severe episode of bipolar disorder, or psychotic, and has lots to touch with reality. Um, food can be part of their treatment plan, but it is not. You might have to do something much more serious, and um, you know, change, changing at that point, have them in the emergency room, have them be evaluated. So, that being said, I do think there's a place for medications in psychiatry, and I still do prescribe medications in certain instances. In ADHD uh, and ADD, it's one of the places that I think medications can, because they work so quickly and they uh, can be immediately helpful to someone. And you can often then see while the person feels different, they can focus, they feel calmer. Um, they, they not, not as interested in, you know, say engaging in other 
um, other types of habits which may not be good for them, such as substance abuse, um, uh, not just you know having an occasional glass of wine, but actually having problems with 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 um, alcohol and drugs. So I do think there's a role for them. It much depends on the severity of the symptoms and how they present. Um, because we can you know, we go back to the gut brain again, you know, because we, our gut, um, our microbiome is so, most of it is so hugely unique, each person does respond differently. So I've had individuals who could work with me on a very solid nutritional psychiatry plan based on what they were eating, what their presentation was, and how they responded. And I've also had people who I work, um, you know, have worked with and feel that, you know, the, the, they can use these as complementary measures, but they still need a medication. And I think both work. Um, You know, what what I'm always concerned about is that people become dependent on the medication Mm -hmm. or some individuals abuse the medication. And and those are always the concerns. Well, I mean, look, I I would be lying to you if I told you that, you know, modafinil hadn't been effective for me. It's been incredibly effective in in terms of allowing me to do what I need to do at time, you know, on times. Absolutely. Uh, But you talk about, you know, and it's funny because I I remember I had this exact conversation with another physician, Tara Swarth, who wrote uh, a book uh, and she was a guest here at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this and it's one thing she had, you know, really hammered me on. She's like, okay, make sure you're drinking, you know, water every day. So if you were in my situation, if that was the case, Mm -hmm. like, you're doing that those two combos like how would you balance it out with food to basically make sure you're getting a proper balance because sure. i know that you know one of the things even when you're going through hd we talked you talked about caffeine quite a bit i think mm-hmm. that pretty much anybody listening to this with a few exceptions their sort of default is a decent amount of coffee and i when mm-hmm. i saw when you broke it down i was like oh that's not good like i must be having way too much caffeine more than i right. realized exactly so so um, I, I think I think that's again a great question and one that I appreciate being answered because many people are doing both. They're not just using nutritional strategies. A good uh, percentage of the patients I see are on medications and trying to really enhance the effect. Um, I'm, I'm glad that that's helped your sense of focus and if it makes help you function, that's super important. Hydration is is very important. Hydration is important anyway in life. It just something that you know does our body good and water is is a simple thing that we can do irrespective of being on a medication or being on any type of diet. The other thing that we found was that uh, breakfast was really important. So sometimes medications that one takes, if they certainly if someone's taking it in the morning, people do not feel hungry. And uh, what we, what one of the things we looked at in terms of the research was that it was really important to start the day with something. So we created a smoothie in the book. And the reason we created the smoothie was that we looked at studies and one of these studies that came up with some strong evidence offered a protein bar to the recipients in the study. But it was a protein bar made for the study, so we, it wasn't something we could say to people, oh, you can you can buy it at you know the supermarket. Um, so we used the ingredients from that and we broke it down and made it into a smoothie in the book. Um, wow. and, and we do think that starting with breakfast, we're being well hydrated and, and have your cup of coffee. You know, the, yeah. there's no harm done. But just don't have tons of it because you want to balance it out in other ways. So, you know, we've given you some foods to, foods to avoid, but including things like the um, polyphenols, you know, the antioxidants in certain foods, having um, rich sources of vitamin B and C in your diet, and then making sure you have the minerals that can actually be lacking. And yeah. you can you you can certainly take a supplement, but we also provide food lists in the book of things like um, zinc and potassium and magnesium of things that you can eat. So just just sort of reworking your diet, and you know maybe maybe thinking what can I do? How can I, how many different colors of things can I put in my salad? And what good source of protein can I add to this as well? Yeah. Um, but then it, it, you know it's um, things like dairy. We 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 found some research on the um, A one milk caseins. So yeah. it turns out that you can actually buy A2 milk in the supermarket, um, you know, and and the, these are options that are, are helpful for people to know. So the, the what's interesting is, is like the, I just want to make sure I'm coming to the right conclusion is that like the right diet, because you're right, you know, if you take any of these medications, you take a modafinil, like you're like, I want my coffee and I'm not feeling hungry until like right. noon. Yeah. And uh, you know, the other thing, the the thing that I wondered about, because you brought up dairy is, you know, you talk about the fact that yogurt and granola can be great for your stomach issues, which, you know, I, I've had issues with IBS, but on, mm-hmm. and does this like fly in in contrast to that or does that still hold with the case of of any sort of focus or adhd type symptoms so that sounds like it basically the diet like starting with the smoothie you're talking about would actually enhance the effects of the modafinil 
Exactly. That and, and it's really intended it's intended to be and showing the research that breakfast helped in, helped individuals with their focus. So it's it's intended to be we know that the we understand that the medications can keep help help people not feel hungry. And you know, the flip side of that is some people think of it as a weight loss option and which as a psychiatrist just becomes very problematic. Yeah. Um I know that wasn't the case with you, but but I'm just, you know, mentioning that. Um, so having breakfast, you know, having your coffee when you'd like, but making, so make, make sure you have something when you have your pull or maybe even have something to eat and then have your pull so that that way you, you're not having that feeling of, oh my God, I really don't feel like eating. Right. It's, 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 it's in a situation like this. And I, I really love this question because it's sort of a live example of implementing all of these things, building up the diet and then being wary of, um, you know, things that stimulate your gut. So in your case, um, you know, f- fiber-rich foods or um, the probiotics may actually be uncomfortable. And then your gastroenterologist may say, you know, even though you're trying to help these symptoms when, with your ADHD, these are things which are really making your gut worse. So that's where the plan becomes highly individualized for, for people. Um, right. And and where the functional component of, of the work that I do comes in, because it's sort of finding the root cause. Someone who yeah. presented with panic a few years ago ended up having gut inflammation and when we worked on anti-inflammatory foods and a whole diet um, and a meal plan to improve her gut, the panic went away. Um, mm. You know, so so it's, it's each person is, I would say, slightly different. And in your case, you know, uh, those options for the pre and probiotics and um, fiber-rich foods may not be the best, depending on what your gastroenterologist says. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, because I've been starting with with yogurt and granola. And then when I read that, I thought, oh, I wonder if, if the smoothie you're talking about would be a better option. Right. And you could use, you know, if if, if you if you like dairy, um, then mm-hmm. try the your option would be to try A2 milk because yeah. or goat's milk or sheep's milk because they, it doesn't have the A1 caseins yeah. that are actually shown to be uncomfortable. And then gluten as well, mm-hmm. unfortunately, came up in in being problematic and, yeah. and sugar, you know, so sugar, uh, sugar unfortunately shows up everywhere. Yeah. I, well, it's funny you, you mentioned sugar because, you know, every now and then I have this, you know, momentary sort of cheat day of, oh, I'll wake up on a Sunday morning. I was like, oh, you know what? Sounds amazing right now. Dunkin' Donuts. And we have a Dunkin' yeah. Donuts right around the corner. Yeah. And literally one hour after I eat it, I just feel suddenly this crash mentally that I, I was yeah. like, oh, why did I do this yeah. to myself? Yeah. Uh, I was well, like, this we, is we, definitely we, not going to help. We, 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 I, no, I, I I know the feeling. I've had the feeling. You know, we're big fans in Boston of Dunkin' Donuts. It started here, so so I hear what you say, and it it, it has happened to one to to many of us on any given day. But it's exactly that feeling. It's like, hey, I really want that you know tasty treat of whatever it is, and um, and I'd encourage you just psychologically to call it a treat day, you know, and then mm-hmm. course correct at the at the next meal that you have. But yeah. it's that crash that none of us enjoy. Um, and you know, the the other thing. You know, an ADHD, um, just, just for you to be aware, you know, you mentioned going shopping and your roommate who cooks being away, the, pro- the, the processed foods with the food colorings and additives and dyes and all of that are just not good for ADHD. So, so maybe just thinking of, you know, hummus and, and crudite and, you know, snacks that, that are still whole foods um, and, and better than, you know, the more processed uh, ideas. Right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up by talking about libido. I realized that you know my, my choices, as I said, were really bizarre as to which areas to cover. But I figured <laughs> I was like, these might be the most universally relatable ones. I was like, you know, I can't focus. I want to have sex, um, you know, and I might not feel as happy as I want to be. I was like, yeah, you know, everybody probably to some degree has basically dealt with all three of them. Right. Um, I, you know, right. in the interest of time, actually, you know what? Let, let's do two in the interest of time if we can do them quickly. The first one is insomnia and fatigue, and then let's do libido. Sure. So insomnia, my tip for that is um, to include, um, as you as you know, Srinivas, was the long list in the book, but my, my tip is usually include melatonin rich foods in your diet because you can have, and I say flip your breakfast uh, by having an omelet or frittata at night, eggs, um, certain fish, milk, and things like um, asparagus and broccoli all have melatonin. And I have a few tips about just, you know, have that in the evening, start to get your body ready for sleep by having natural sources of melatonin. There are also some other foods in the book, including things like tart cherries, which it turns out you can, in fact, order online um, and make your own juice or have it as a snack. So so those are just 
you know, a few, a few things. There are also ideas like having, um, making overnight oats using rolled oats and adding in some walnut sunflower seeds and uh, flax seeds, because those in fact are also rich in uh, melatonin. So perhaps it's something you can have in the evening, um, you know, to, to, to kind of help, help your body get ready to rest and, and start to, to help you help yourself get ready to sleep. Hmm. Cool. Um, well, let's talk uh, about libido. Like I, I'd never made that connection. I was like, wow, is like the food you eat impacts your sex drive. I mean, I could see why it would, but right. uh, you know, that's even more fascinating. I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, how can <laughs> you improve it with food? Exactly. So, you know, again, we have the, the foods to embrace and the foods to avoid and things that, you know, showed up as positives with things like pistachios, um, things that uh, boosted, uh, you know, certain uh, hormone called oxytocin, like dark chocolate. So dark chocolate, you know, uh, the darker, the better. The flavonoids in dark chocolate are great for the brain, but it turned out they also help libido. And other things that uh, boosted this hormone oxytocin included magnesium and um, some essential amino acids acids that were found in things like um, certain types of dairy, certain vegetables and eggs. Um, but also, you know, uh, pomegranate juice was found to be, uh, hit a high note. So I think that incorporating those foods, um, in fact, if you look at the food list, you can actually incorporate those things on the day you're going on a date. You know, you can you can save your glass of red wine for the for the dinner, but you can start your day with coffee. You can include these foods in different ways throughout the day. And you can start to do it more regularly if, you know, if, you, if you're struggling a little bit with your libido. And yeah. some herbs and spices that helped were saffron and fenugreek. So, you know, if, if you're cooking, to me, Ross, if, you, if you're upping your cooking game there, you might want to make biryani with the saffron on top for your date the next time. <laughs> <laughs> so that suddenly she's like, why do I feel so aroused from eating your food? Exactly. Great. Exactly. Well, I'm sure that's going to do wonders right eating life. <laughs> um, so I had one one other question. You brought up dark chocolate, and it's kind of funny because this is one of those ones that I wonder about. As somebody who has like a real sweet tooth, mm-hmm. I've always justified an excuse to eat dark chocolate in the afternoon and go buy yeah. chocolate bars. Oh, Jim Quick says this is brain food. Now you've given me the go ahead, right. but I'm assuming there's some sort of you know line here. Yeah, yeah. So so it's the darker the better, meaning more than seventy percent. So I'm trying really talking about okay. those dark pieces of chocolate chunks or the those very... are hard to eat just by like more than one or two because they're so bitter. Well, part of it is how you pair it and, and getting your palate used to, because it's, it's really just not the candy bars we're talking about. And here's the reason. Most of the candy bars that are yummy, um, I have a certain percent of chocolate in, but they're largely um, uh, fat and uh, cocoa butter and um, uh, sugars, added sugars. So all of each of those ingredients, except the of course, pure sugar, not necessarily entirely bad, but the benefit, the brain benefit of dark chocolate comes from the actual flavonoids in the cacao, which is why you want it so dark. And the fact Mm. that um, um, the cacao beans are uh, fermented makes it a good food for your gut. So there are many benefits of that dark chocolate. So what I like to do is if people are trying to get used to it, there's some newer brands that um, are sold at certain supermarkets, which have, you know, a little bit of sweetening from say erythritol, um, but really not a ton of sugar. And it's kind of getting used to those, but also how about, you know, starting to pair dark chocolate with strawberries or Mm -hmm. dark chocolate with slices of citrus, you know, have the sweet from a natural fruit, um, you know, and, and, and try, try to get used to it that way. Um, and adding it into, you know, have a recipe for dark chocolate dipped strawberries. And there's a way to do that and still get the benefit actually of, of, uh, uh, the, both the strawberries and the dark chocolate and that one. So yeah, you're right. It's not the, you know, not the average candy bar. It's the super right. dark chocolate more than 70% and some other things that we, we talk wow. about. Wow. Um, well, this has been incredible. Like there's so much in here, you know, like I said, I, I just having to go through the book, I was just like, okay, this is like so much. There's no way we could cover all of this in an hour conversation. But um, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews here mm-hmm. at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I think, um, I think if they can true, I think that if a person can truly be themselves, they shine in their own light. And I think for each one of us, it's finding that sweet spot of overcoming the angst, the fear, the insecurities that we may have in different components in our lives and stepping forth into being our true selves 
because I truly have seen that when people do that, um, there's just a light that shines from within that that uh, really cannot be um, cannot be taken away from them. So that's mm. my that's what I think. Amazing. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your wisdom and your insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, the book, and everything else that you're up to? Uh, thanks, Reva. So the book is available at uh, you know major online retailers, and my um, handle on social media is at Dr. Uma Naidu, which is at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O. My book site is book.umanaidumd.com. Uh, you can Google umanaidumd.com. You get to my website. Um, and I wanted to thank you. I had a lovely conversation and um, just fascinated by your, your great questions, uh, the way that you thought about the book and uh, had so much fun speaking to you. Likewise. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Even though my family is filled with amazing cooks, me being in the kitchen is basically a fire hazard waiting to happen, but I still want to eat healthy. And if you want to eat healthier and feel your best, then listen up. This is hands down one of the easiest ways. I've been drinking something called cachava as my breakfast to fuel my day. And it keeps me full for hours and it takes less than a minute to make, which is pretty awesome. So what is it? It's been called the cleanest, most nutrient dense meal imaginable. And I describe it as the best protein, vitamins, and everything you need to eat healthy all in one shake. It's loaded with over 70 superfoods and nutrients like maca root, chia seeds, sachaini, makai berry, acai, and coconut. And it actually tastes really good. The people who built this company started in the jungle on the side of a mountain during a health retreat. And their mission is to bring the world's best superfoods into a single ready-to-go meal to help busy people stay healthy on the go. And Kachava is offering 10% off for the listeners of our podcast. Just go to kachava.com slash creative. Again, that's Kachava. K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash creative for 10% off. Instead of spending your day in back-to-back meetings, try a new kind of FaceTime with Loom. You can use Loom to get a quick recording of your screen and webcam explaining what the team needs to know. It uploads while you record, so it's ready to share as soon as you are done. Just copy the link and paste it in Slack, Teams, or an email and get back to work. A three-minute video just might replace your next 30-minute meeting. Visit Loom.com to try Loom for free. That's Loom.com to try Loom for free today. Loom. See you at work.